Hello, everyone, to this June presentation of the Friends of History First Wednesday Lecture Series. I'm Ben Woodbury with the Friends of History and will serve as your host. As always, let me start with a few administrative details before today's presentation. As a reminder, all recent past and future First Wednesday online lectures are now available on our new Friends of History webpage, which is provided below in the text. Just click on the lecture series link at the top of the page. Our monthly lectures are being provided free of charge by the Friends of History with support from the New Mexico History Museum. We do, however, accept and encourage donations that will go to directly support the lecture series and more importantly, all history museum programs and exhibits. Should you wish to make a donation, just go to our new website and click on the donate button at the top of the page. Before introducing today's speaker, I want you to know that for our next lecture on July 7th, our speakers will be Chris Huggard and Terry Humble. They will speak on Santa Rita, New Mexico, Two Centuries of Copper Mining, drawing from their book of the same name. Chris received his PhD from UNM and has written extensively on mining in New Mexico. Terry is a local historian from Santa Rita and worked at the Chino Mine until retiring in 2001. If you wish to be on our mailing list to learn more about this lecture and all upcoming lectures, you can sign up on our webpage or email us at the address cited below. And now for today's lecture. We're fortunate to have with us Rick Hendricks, State Records Administrator for New Mexico. As well, Rick is a former state historian and editor of the Vargas Project at the University of New Mexico. As many of you know, he has written extensively on the history of the American Southwest in Mexico. Among his most recent books is Pueblo Indian Sovereignty, Land and Water in New Mexico and Texas, which he co-authored with Malcolm Ebright and was published by the University of Oklahoma Press in 2019. Following the presentation, Rick will join us for a live question and answer session. Your questions and comments can be posted at any time on the YouTube chat room window both during and after the presentation. Upon completion of today's event, both the lecture and the Q&A session will be posted on the Friends of History webpage, as well as the History Museum's YouTube and Facebook pages. And now we welcome Rick Hendricks. Um, hello everyone, I'm Rick Hendricks. Uh, New Mexico State Records Administrator, and I'm going to be talking to you about um, Pueblo sovereignty uh, this morning. Um, and what my remarks are going to be is uh, derived primarily from a fairly recent book, Pueblo Sovereignty, Indian Land and Water in New Mexico and Texas. Uh, this is my colleague, um, longtime writing partner, Malcolm Ebright and I. Um, and we published this book uh, with the University of Oklahoma Press. So I'm gonna start with a couple of definitions of sovereignty. One is from the book, and of course, the book is really focused on land and water. Um, and so this is the definitions. This is sort of our working definition of sovereignty for our book. Um, Sovereignty in the sense of exercising the right to control one's land. One can, what can and should happen on it is the lens through which the Pueblo Indians see the world. So this was really sort of what we, we tried to stay focused on, on this idea um, as, as we were going through a series of case studies. Um, this next slide, um, this is a definition that the Indian Pueblo Cultural Center uses for tribal sovereignty. It's a little bit more expansive, um, covers more areas than, than we covered in our study. Um, 
the tribe's inherent right to self-govern its people and territory and to self-determine their futures. And these are two really important ideas um, in the concept of Pueblo sovereignty. Um, the idea of self-government, um, you often hear the idea of uh, government to government relations. So the, the Pueblo tribes are sovereign governments. They have the, their own government organization, police forces, all those types of things that a government would have. And of course, self-determination, another concept. So um, I, one of the principal ideas that we have to understand when we look at the struggle for Pueblo control of its land in New Mexico is the concept of the Pueblo League. Um, it's actually fairly simple. As you can see, this is a, um, a stylized drawing of an Indian Pueblo. Um, you can see the church in the middle and, and um, sort of ideally the land that was granted to um, each Pueblo in New Mexico was measured from the, the door of the church. Um, it was measured to the four winds, north, south, east, and west, 5,000 varas in each direction. Um, and many of them, in fact, in New Mexico still describe a fairly perfect square. Um, some of them obviously for reasons of topography don't uh, describe a square. And, some of them don't have that amount of land, but if you if you had that Pueblo League, um, that would be uh, seventeen thousand four hundred acres in area of, of that, and that would be the core um, for your Pueblo. When when the U.S. Um, occupied this area after the military period, and then when it becomes a territory. The Office of the Surveyor General was created in 1854, and the idea was that land titles would be examined by the Surveyor General, and recommendations on the titles would be made and sent to Congress. And if they were approved, um, they would be uh, issued a patent for that land. Um, and so the Surveyor General called in land records, and with respect to the public people, um, what was often presented was a document that we refer to as the Crusate Grants. These were fraudulent grants that were created sometime in the 19th century. They were purported to be, you can see in the upper corner there, it says Año de 1689. They were supposedly uh, created in El, El Paso del Norte, today's Ciudad Juarez. They were created for each Pueblo. Um, and, they basically, most of them just lay out uh, a four square league grant. Um, um, they're called the Crusate Grants because um, the governor of New Mexico in 1689 was uh, Domingo Hironza Petris de Crusate. And so Anglos took the last name and called them the Crusate Grants. Um, and so by Late 1856, there were documents like this presented that related in some way to 11 Pueblos in New Mexico. Um, the Surveyor General ignored any other documents that were presented and really focused on these Crusade documents. Uh, and nine of them were subsequently submitted to the Secretary of the Interior eventually um, with the idea that they would be um, presented to Congress for confirmation. Those grants form the core land holdings of all of these Pueblos, Hickory, Soquiawinga, Cochiti, Kiwa, Santa Domingo, uh, San Felipe, Hemis, Zia, and Acoma. Now those don't happen to be the ones that we focused our study on because there was a lot already known. So one thing that was interesting about the Surveyor General and their examination of Pueblo land holdings was that there was no way for the Surveyor General to resolve the question of overlapping grants. And so Pueblo grants often overlapped each other um, and Hispano grants uh, very frequently overlapped uh, Pueblo square league grants. So this was a, a big problem that was not resolved. So in 1891, uh, they took another, the federal government took another stab at solving land grant issues in New Mexico. And, they created the Court of Private Land Claims. And in, in this court, you can see from 1891 to 1904, it, 
examined and in many cases re-examined um, titles, um, deed records, something to sort of prove ownership of land. And pretty much uniformly, uh, the actions of both the Surveyor General and the Court of Private Land Claims uh, eroded um, claims, Indian claims to land. Um, and um, that was sort of the process that was that was going on uh, through through both of these entities. Now, in our book, we looked at case studies of a number of different Pueblos just to see what they did to sort of make expressions of sovereignty. And, and what we referred to as acting sovereign, um, actions that they took um, that would um, in some way express, try to defend their, their sovereignty. So the first one that we're going to look at is Powaki. Now, most of the images that I have are, I mean, because we don't have many early images, they're often often of the church. But the story of Powaki that, that I really want to talk about briefly is, and this is the case for all of the studies uh, that we did of all of these Pueblos, they were at one time or another abandoned um, in their history and then resettled. And so... Um, Pawaki was abandoned in a period that we often refer to as the Second Pueblo Revolt. Most people are aware of the 1680 Pueblo Revolt, but there was another Pueblo Revolt in 1696. Um, and as a result of that activity, um, the, the Pueblo was abandoned and people moved to uh, nearby Pueblos such as Nambe or Tezuki. Some of them moved to live with the Navajos. But anyway, they left and they were gone for a decade from 1696 to 1706. Um, then they were resettled. Uh, Governor Francisco Cuero y Valdez resettled, the, drew all the Picaris people that he could find. Also some people from Hakona and Cuyamunga drew them back into Powaki and they remained a, a viable Pueblo. Um, but over time through uh, the end of the Spanish period, in the Mexican period, in the early American period, non-Indians began to occupy the land around Powake and their land base began to shrink. And because they couldn't um, feed the people, they couldn't produce enough land, the population also began to shrink. And so from 1912 to 1932, um, the Pueblo was uh, abandoned again. Um, people left again to nearby Pueblos. Some of the people went to Colorado. Um, but one of the things, the, the actions that they took that's most interesting to me with the respect of acting sovereign was that they left in a home in Powake um, the canes of authority, the Pueblo canes. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit more later about the Pueblo canes but they left those canes there with the idea that they would come back and reoccupy. And beginning in, in 1932, they did in fact reoccupy and they've, and they've been, um, been there ever since. Um, the other point that I wanted to mention, another example of Powake acting sovereign, um, in 1994, there was a very contentious race for the governor a ship in New Mexico. Uh, governor King was running again. Casey Luna was running again. Was running. Uh, he was lieutenant governor. Uh, you had um, Governor um, Johnson, uh, future governor. So a very contentious race. And at this time, most of the Pueblo communities had signed gambling compacts, gaming compacts with New Mexico, but Powake hadn't signed one, and Governor King um, refused to do that. And so. Um, in 1996, uh, Powake Governor Villarreal, um, he didn't exactly blockade the highway, but he slowed the highway down. He handed out um, flyers talking about the Pueblo's rights to have uh, casino-style gaming. gaming. Um, and in 1997, Governor Johnson signed the compact. Um, so in that period, um, this is another interesting quote that came out of that period uh, or the, when, when they were trying to resettle it. Um, 
this was from a member of the Pueblo Lands Board. So this was resolved. Uh, and I, I can't think that a Pueblo ceases to be a Pueblo as it grows smaller. There is some kind of interest left to the last man and that has to be recognized. And, that, and that's really in fact what, what happened there. The, the next one I wanna to talk to briefly about is uh, Nambe Pueblo. Um, uh, the case of Nambe and, and their exercise of uh, sovereignty that I wanted to mention has to do with two grants that were called the Sierra Mosca grants. Um, and these grants were examined by the officer surveyor general. And um, they were very obviously forgeries. They were forgeries of uh, Governor Armijo's signature, very, very crude forgeries. There were hundreds, if not thousands of examples of his signature that were available to the surveyor general. But for whatever reason, um, those two grants were approved. And so years later, the, the Pueblo, because they had advocates, lawyers who were working on their behalf, um, carried the case to the United States Supreme Court. Um, and they were able to get that those grants overturned. And as a result, um, the Pueblo uh, was granted a small reservation. So again, another, another avenue for acting sovereign, this time um, using uh, advocates, uh, lawyers, and going all the way to the US Supreme Court. Um, I wanna talk next about Tezuke. Tezuke Pueblo, the, the event that I want to focus on there um, is called the, the Pueblo, uh, Tezuke Pueblo Fence War. So in 1922, um, the encroachment of non-Indians on uh, Tezuke land was getting to be so severe um, that it looked like the Pueblo was not going to be able to survive. They didn't have enough land to produce what they needed. Um, and these, uh, uh, a number of these people were, by this point, were Anglos. Uh, a, a man named Ed Newman was one of the uh, standout individuals. And what he was doing was was putting up fences that were on uh, Tezuki land. And so on the advice of an Indian agent who asked the people of Nambe not to mention that he had told them to do this, he recommended that they take the fences down. Um, and so uh, this was a very interesting act of uh, civil disobedience in a way. Um, they went out and they rolled up, rolled up his fences. Um, and they also ended up rolling up the fences of another, uh, another Anglo man. And that led to uh, an examination of the deeds of those people um, who purported to have land that overlapped um, the Tezuki uh, uh, four square league grant. Um, and when they examined them, they determined that in fact, uh, Tezuki had a really strong right to that land. And um, so therefore uh, they were right in removing the fences. Um, Isleta Pueblo, um, this is Isleta south of Albuquerque. Um, unlike the other Pueblos that we looked at in the study, Isleta is actually a very big Pueblo. It, it, it always has been uh, when it was occupied. It's always been a very large Pueblo. Um, throughout its history, particularly in the Mexican period and into the uh, Anglo period, there were a lot of battles um, with um, surrounding non-Indian landowners. Uh, there's a lot of overlapping grant activity that happens in that area. Uh, and throughout the whole period of time as they were battling these, that Isleta was fortunate to have uh, a lawyer um, that was very active and very helpful. There was a Frenchman, Gustave Solenac, that, that helped them um, a great deal. But throughout their the latter part of the 19th century and into the 20th century, um, they pursued what we refer to as the quest for the crest. Um, there was a, in that area, there was a grant that immediately adjacent to the Isleta grant, the Lode Padilla grant, 
Um, and the grant called for the boundary to go to the crest of the Monsanto Mountains. Um, and that was a grant um, that um, Isleta purchased. And so this grant was in fact surveyed to the top of the Monsanto Mountains, but the Isleta grant, um, which they did not, do not have um, and did not have at, in the 1850s, a grant document uh, to present, uh, it was immediately adjacent and yet um, it was it was only actually surveyed, it was meandered at the base of the mountains. And so from, uh, from the time the grant, so from the 1850s until 1918, that was the situation. And in 1918, the people of Isleta, again, in, in very much an act of acting sovereign, went, took a delegation and went to Washington uh, and presented their evidence um, that, that the grant should in fact be measured to the crest of the Manzanos. Um, and so um, that was ordered to be done. A new survey was ordered. Um, and, but it was not until 1932 that it was actually resurveyed. So um, from 1918, when the, uh, the federal government recognized that the grant should have gone to the top of the Monsanos until 1932, um, it was not done. And the person who was really leading the, um, the charge for all these years was um, a man named Pablo Abeta uh, from Isleta Pueblo. He had, uh, in the course of his life, he was a uh, lieutenant governor on five separate occasions. Uh, he was highly educated. He went to St. Michael's. Um, he was very articulate in English and Spanish, um, and he spoke uh, uh, nine uh, indigenous languages. Uh, Ernie Pyle, the famous reporter, uh, once commented that Pablo Abeta spoke better English than he did. So anyway, after all these years, by 1932, they were able to regain um, the area to the top of the crest. Um, and that added an additional 21,415 acres to their land base. So um, quite, quite a, a, a big addition to their, to their land base through their uh, activity. Um, another example of Isleta Pueblo acting sovereign happened in the 1990s. Um, there in um, 1972, the Clean Water Act uh, set out um, certain guidelines. And then in 1987, um, it was amended. And the way it was amended was such that uh, tribes um, could have their own water standards. And so it's led a Pueblo because they're downriver from Albuquerque and obviously the, 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 the discharge from um, sewage plants in Albuquerque um, would come down to, um, down to Isleta um, and, and of course they use the water to irrigate their fields. Um, Isleta adopted standards that were much higher than the city of Albuquerque. Um, and um, the city of Albuquerque refused to comply with Isleta standards. And so this went to court and eventually um, Isleta's higher standards were, were upheld and um, the city of Albuquerque had to upgrade the quality of the water that they discharged that went down. So again, another, another avenue, uh, another example of, of Isleta acting to protect uh, their sovereignty. Now, I want to move now to a Pueblo that maybe many of you are much less familiar with. Um, this is Isleta del Sur, which is a Pueblo that is in um, inside the city of El Paso, Texas. Um, this was a community that for um, up until um, the war with Mexico, um, basically uh, was part of New Mexico. The people who settled it came from Isleta up north and from the uh, Salinas Basin um, and, and after the Pueblo Revolt went down and settled in this community in the El Paso area. Um, because 
um, Texas came into the United States as a republic um, in 1845, having been a republic since it broke away from Mexico in 1836, it came in with a whole different set of laws. Um, and the laws with respect to Indian pueblos were, were quite different. Um, and also, um, Texas didn't come in with any federal land, so there wouldn't be any land to set aside for reservations. Um, and so um, initially, this community of uh, Tiwa speaking Pueblo Indians living in um, the El Paso area had no, no recognition. Um, in the 1850s, um, Calhoun, who was both Indian agent and governor of New Mexico, had identified two Pueblos in the El Paso area, Isleta del Sur and Socorro, as being um, Pueblo communities. Isleta is Tiwa, Socorro was Pito. Um, but because of the um, fact that Texas came in not in the way that other states joined the Union, um, they did not enjoy any uh, federal recognition. They didn't get their four square league grant, um, any of those types of things. So um, in 1968, um, through the work of a law firm in the El Paso area, um, the federal government um, agreed to cede any responsibility it might have, although it hadn't really recognized anybody, to the state of Texas. Um, and that's sort of the way it stayed uh, until 1987, um, when the, uh, the same law firm um, was able to get the U.S. Congress to re uh, restore um, Isleta del Sur to uh, the federal government. And so the main way other, so that they've pursued their, their rights as a native community through litigation um, primarily, um, and the other expression that they have pursued uh, very aggressively, uh, pretty much unsuccessfully, um, is they have tried to have uh, casino gam gaming um, in the way that the other tribes have. But again, because Texas law with respect to Native peoples is different, um, they have not been able to do that. They had a casino for a while, um, and it, um, it was forcibly closed down. Um, they have had a lawsuit up until uh, fairly recently. They've been pursuing lawsuits again unsuccessfully, um, and maybe in the future they will do that again. So I, I want to do one final um, case study uh, very quickly. This is Sandia Pueblo. This is not from the Pueblo Sovereignty book. Um, um, this is actually, this case study was in a book that Malcolm Ebright and Richard Hughes and I published a number of years ago called uh, Four Square Leagues, um, Indian Land in New Mexico. And so Sandia is is unique among all of the communities uh, in New Mexico in that they actually have a fully authenticated uh, Spanish land grant. Um, dates from 1748. It is the only original uh, land grant that has survived. There are multiple copies of it. Um, there are copies here um, in New Mexico, and there are also copies in uh, Mexico City. Um, this is a picture, uh, this is an image of one of the pages of the document um, that was used when um, trying to litigate the land issue and the, the basic land issue related to Sandia is again, as in the case of Isleta, um, why the land was not surveyed to the crest in this case of the Sandia Mountains. Um, the Lota Padilla, the Isleta grant are often used as examples of grants that were surveyed to the mountaintop. Um, and this one was only meandered at the bottom. And of course it made a lot of difference in terms of the land that went to the Pueblo. And you can see this document has pieces that are torn out of it. Um, you can see there's 
a, a big part of a line that's missing there, other parts. This is not through um, uh, time. These were these pieces were actually pinched out of the document. Um, that there, that activity was recorded. It was witnessed and recorded. And so the idea was to change the text of the document so that um, they could be uh, altered. Now, um, Sandia pursued litigation. Um, it eventually led to a settlement, not that returned the, the mountain to, to Sandia Pueblo, but an arrangement with the Forest Service um, so that the Indians could have access to, um, for ceremonial purposes. Um, uh, and so all of these things that I've been talking about here now for about a half an hour are, are examples of uh, Pueblos acting in a way to express their sovereignty. And I want to talk just briefly about the probably the most significant symbol of, of Pueblo sovereignty, and that's the the famous Pueblo canes, the most famous of which are the Lincoln canes. Now, this is a uh, a little flyer about a um, video that was made a number of years ago, Canes of Power. Um, I highly recommend this if you're interested in the story of, of the Pueblo Canes. Um, it's very, very educational. It's very nicely done. Um, there's information. You could have a little study group um, about it. Um, if you wanted to, there's information about the canes. So canes, as I'm sure most all of you know, canes are a symbol of authority that is really universal. Every culture in the world uh, uh, has used canes. Canes were used before Europeans came to the New World. Um, there are a number of examples of Native American groups in, in Mexico that were in, in the northern part, the Tato Umara, for example, um, used canes of authority. So we know that this idea of, of canes had been here. Um, one of the things that's mentioned in this particular production is that um, the Pueblo people also had canes. Um, that we haven't been able to establish from the documentary record, but um, on the basis of oral history, that that is one of the statements that may, is made. Um, probably the Spanish government was giving canes to Pueblos, um, to individuals they recognized as authority figure. Um, we think as early as 1620, perhaps earlier, it could have even been with Oñate, although there, there are not any specific, specific references. We know that when Diego de Vargas came back um, to New Mexico in 1692 and then resettled in 1693, um, he probably brought a, a, a crate of canes. Um, so some of them were very elaborate ebony canes with silver tips, um, but others were, were probably simple hardwood canes and they were distributed. Um, now we think of them as the governor of a Pueblo, uh, the lieutenant governor, maybe a, a war chief or some other people, but Vargas was distributing them more liberally. So there were actually a lot of canes that were um, distributed in that um, late 17th century. And of course, canes are given again um, by the Mexican government. Um, they're given again by Governor King. Uh, Nixon gave a cane to um, Taos Pueblo with the return of Blue Lake. Um, and the Spanish government in the 20th century uh, came to the Southwest and presented two canes. Um, one came to Isleta del Sur because they had been missed early um, and another to a Northern Pueblo that had also refused to accept the canes um, that had been distributed. So the most Famous canes are the Lincoln canes. In 1864, Dr. Michael Stack, who was the superintendent of Indian Affairs in New Mexico, made arrangements for the distribution of um, canes. 
These are the famous canes that bear um, A. Lincoln, uh, the date on the cap of the cane. Um, and, and these are, are highly, highly venerated actually. And, and these are the canes that the governor uh, carries. And it, again, a sign of authority, a sign of sovereignty as representing um, government to government uh, authority. So that's um, what I have. I'm going to stop the share. Uh, welcome again, everyone. And uh, I wanted to remind folks that if you have a question, uh, by all means, please post it on uh, the YouTube uh, chat page uh, or the uh, Facebook uh, chat page as both, both links are open. And uh, so that if you have any questions following up on Rick's talk. Rick, I want to thank you. Um, I find it a fascinating story um, and a, a very detailed one. The... Uh, um, one of the things I was struck by, and I've always been curious, is that in terms of when, if I understand correctly, de Vargas returned, uh, he was, it was under his auspices that uh, you were able to, uh, that uh, he issued the uh, Pueblo uh, League, the four square leagues uh, boundaries for the Pueblos. And uh, I was curious to know how, if, there were, if you had any information on how he came to that in terms of what the uh, origins were. I know that it was an intent, intended, you know, to, to recognize the Pueblos as, as, uh, with, with autonomy and to help make amends in terms of some of the, uh, in terms of the earlier uh, Spanish colonial period. But uh, beyond that, I just wondered if you had any further insights that you could share. So um, in, in New Spain, um, present day Mexico, there was another, um, another measurement, uh, first uh, 500 leagues, then 600 leagues that were also given in squares um, to, to native communities um, as uh, their land base. So that's where, at least in terms of um, New Spain and into New Mexico, that's where the idea originated. Um, we don't really know exactly why it was expanded to be a league in each direction, which was considerably larger than the amount given. Um, it's possible that it was uh, taking into consideration the fact that this is an uh, arid climate. Um, it is also conceivable that it's a misinterpretation of um, a line in the laws of the Indies, which refers to a league. Um, and it, it's possible that it was interpreted to mean a league in each direction. Um, whatever the case, um, the, this idea of awarding a square of land, um, Vargas was uh, most, um, his most proximate contact with that was in New Spain, but actually in Spanish possessions all through Latin America, um, the practice of giving land in a square or in some cases in some other configuration um, was pretty common. And so um, it actually wasn't Vargas himself that gave that. It was uh, one of his trusted lieutenants in 1704 who left the first record of uh, measuring a league in each direction. So certainly in, in the Vargas era. Um, and then that became over time part of the case law, if you will, um, in Spanish colonial litigation. Um, we know about it almost exclusively uh, in the context of encroachment on Pueblo land um, and the Pueblo people themselves will invoke their right to the Pueblo League. So absent that documentary record that lays out the lawsuits, um, 
we probably wouldn't know very much about it. Um, there's no real indication that it happened prior to Vargas's time. Um, for, for many, many years, we thought that there was no land granted to Indians, that it was just the, sort of the concept that they had the land that they needed. But when we were doing the research for Four Square Leagues, we came across references where native peoples were referring to boundary markers that had been established prior to the Pueblo Revolt. So there was, um, there is some evidence that there was some land base that was assigned to native peoples even before Vargas's period. Well, thank you. That's very, very helpful. The, uh, um, I'm quite struck with your characterization of the political response to these encroachments and the desire to ensure uh, access to the lands to which they were granted uh, under the Pueblo League. Uh, and, uh, and, and referring to these activities as uh, uh, act, acting sovereignty, um, as a, essentially uh, taking a proactive stance, declaring um, you know, those claims and expressing it in different ways through civil disobedience uh, or through uh, actual uh, court, court action uh, uh, through that. Um, I was quite impressed with the, uh, the importance of the, um, uh, of the Pueblo Canes, uh, in, particularly in the context of uh, Powake uh, as, their, as their populations declined they, they, they left for a while, returned, uh, and then uh, uh, left again, but left the, the canes in place as, as a symbolic uh, declaration that they, uh, of, their, of their claim, uh, their right uh, uh, to, uh, to, to the land. Um, uh, it, it really reinforced with me what you then spoke of later in the, in the presentation in terms of the, the role of the canes themselves. Didn't know if you well, had You know, the, the, um, that story of the canes and the people of Pewaukee leaving the canes, uh, my son is a teacher and he lives in Oregon um, and he's quite interested in um, uh, native rights and incorporating native history into his teacher. He's a science teacher. But that's, uh, he read the book and that's the one story that really resonated with him about the Canes was the fact that, the, um, that they had chosen to leave the Canes. And to me, it's clear evidence that they were saying, we're temporarily leaving, but we're, we're, we're gonna come back. And um, the, the video that, that I recommended, um, uh, Canes of Power, um, it has a really interesting part where um, people from various Pueblo communities talk about the canes and their, their real reverence for the canes and that the canes have become, in a sense, um, animate objects that are fed sacred pollen and that sort of thing. And, mm -hmm. and when they're in, say, the governor's house, they, they have a, a, a place of importance. Um, so really, the, it's um, as a as I say, it, it's, it continues to be the, the most recognizable outward symbol of, of sovereignty. Um, and it continues to this day. I mean, uh, every January when, when the Pueblos elect new officials and they, they have ceremonies where the offices are transferred from one to another, the, the canes are also transferred. So it's, it's a very, important part of that whole process. And if I heard correctly, you in, in, in your discussion, the, 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 it was actually is the, the whole idea of Keynes as a representation of authority. Um, actually, it was a, is, a, is a Western Hemisphere uh, phenomenon. Did, do you know if there was, if, if, if there was any, did the Spanish have, have something uh, it's actually merging of these two two ideas. Or? It, it's actually universal. Um, uh, the The Bible is full of references to Keynes. Um, Keynes, that probably one of the most. I mean, it's there's a direct line from Rome to Spain 
um, to Latin America, to New Mexico, um, of, of the canes being a, a symbol of authority. Um, and that's true in all modern Latin American countries when they transfer power from one um, president to another, if it's not done in the context of a violent coup, um, the transfer of the of the the cane of authority they they take different forms and the the ones in New Mexico are longer, um, almost uh, as long as say a, a walking cane might be, um, but. Um, the Roman ones and the ones used in Spain early on tended to be a, a shorter baton type thing. But um, the, the symbolism attached to the authority figure who had that, um, in Spain it was uh, an alcalde, a, a, a local mayor, or um, uh, and, and Roman officials uh, uh, carried that as a symbol of authority. So uh, virtually every culture, when, when we were researching the book, the thing that surprised us the most, we knew about Middle Eastern culture and, and Roman culture, Western European culture, that it was already so present in the Americas was one thing that really surprised us. Um, North and South America, um, you find um, native groups, um, I know um, in Chile, they had uh, a very similar situation where um, they were giving out many, many canes to the very different groups in, in much the same way that Vargas was giving out many canes. And I, I've seen uh, manifests where the canes would be ordered and they would be shipped out from Spain. Um, and some of them would be uh, very uh, elaborate and decorated ones and some of them would be simple. So that that idea that there was some sort of differentiation between um, the level of the authority figure and what sort of cane he would get and, and the lower figures um, would get a simpler cane. But, but the idea that that authority that was vested in that individual was symbolized by the fact that he was holding that cane, um, it, it's really certainly all through the Spanish world. Um, and, and of course, it's become very much a part of the Pueblo world, which is one of the things that makes it most interesting to me is that uh, it's become part and part of their culture um, in, in, a, in a, a very profound way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's an absolutely fascinating story. And, um, you know, um, so I, I really appreciate you, share, you sharing that. And also sharing in terms of the, you know, looking with the, with a, from a, with a Pueblo perspective in terms of all of the issues in terms of land ownership, which uh, were uh, always an underlying issue and certainly uh, a major issue um, uh, after the uh, uh, when the U.S. after the U.S. assumed control of, of the territory. So uh, I want to thank you very much. Um, it's I uh, uh, really appreciate you taking the time and sharing your, your insights with us. Uh, for our audience, uh, just a reminder that if you are interested in learning more about this, uh, feel, uh, you know, Rick and uh, uh, his colleague, uh, Steve Wright's uh, book is available um, in the museum shop at the History Museum, but also can be purchased, of course, through uh, the University of Oklahoma, if I recall correctly. So uh, feel free. Um, thank you, Rick. Appreciate everything. Thank that you, you do for the opportunity. Any Appreciate last comments? It. Good. Thank you, Rick. Have a good okay. day. Okay, you too.